Chapter 3, The Apostle of Fascism If the international fascist movement has a single founding father, that man would be George Lincoln Rockwell. George took the ideologies and the hateful, vicious drive to exterminate and dominate that Adolf Hitler established, and he found a way to let these things function in a post-World War II era. After the war, fascism had lost its ability to attract a mass audience in the United States. It was seen as the ideology that had torn the world apart, because it was. People wouldn't show up to Nazi party meetings or pay dues or vote as fascists, and so Rockwell instead focused on generating a mass media attention and so Rockwell instead focused on generating mass media attention with the few men he actually had at his disposal. He picketed civil rights marches, wielding signs covered in racial slurs, and trusting in the police to defend him and his outnumbered crew. Even if he could only get nine or ten men to march with him, the rage and violence his signs inspired in counter-protesters were a guarantee of mass media coverage. He spoke at colleges for the same reason, knowing the protests and attacks caused by his presence would get him in the papers and ensure a steady stream of donations. Rockwell positioned himself as a free speech crusader, since arguing to the public about his desire for genocide would have seemed less appealing. These are all tactics modern fascists use today. We see them on display with men like Milo Yiannopoulos, Gavin McInnes and his Proud Boys, Joey Gibson and Patriot Prayer. Whether they know it or not, all these men crib from the playbook of George Lincoln Rockwell. But the fascist movement has evolved considerably since GLR's days. While many of the tools he pioneered are still incredibly effective today, his obsession with Nazi imagery, and the swastika in particular, was doomed for his hopes of ever creating a mass movement. He had started to realize this near the end of his career. In 1966, he came up with a brilliant slogan, White Power, which he had printed up on t-shirts and protest placards. He worked the phrase into his speeches in Chicago, where he arrived to counter-protest Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King was in the city to organize a protest that advocated for more public housing in traditionally white, and thus more affluent, parts of the city. For the first time in his career, Rockwell was able to strike a nerve with a large number of white Americans by focusing on their fear and resentment of black people. On August 6, 1966, Martin Luther King Jr. led a group of marchers through Gage Park. He was met by an enormous crowd of counter-protesters, organized and radicalized by George Lincoln Rockwell. They numbered more than 2,500. The crowd carried placards and banners and blazoned with Rockwell quotes, with Rockwell quotes like, Join the White Rebellion, and We worked hard for what we got. Thousands of furious voices shouted, White power! at King and his comrades. It marked one of the most violent and vicious receptions Dr. King ever received, and it also marked the high point of Rockwell's career. He was shot dead one year later. His dream of fomenting a white revolution, however, did not die with him. It lived on in his apostles, and chief among them was a man named William Luther Pierce. Pierce was born in Atlanta, Georgia, on September 11, 1933. His father, also William Luther Pierce, died in a car accident when he was eight years old. His mother had to scramble to support him and his younger brother. Leonard Zeskind, author of the crucial book Blood and Politics, suspects her background heavily influenced the fascist Pierce would later become. Quote, Marguerite, his mother's biological father, had run off when she was a child, leaving her fatherless until Marguerite's mother, Bill's grandmother, remarried. The new stepfather was a Jewish man from New York who had moved south, and Marguerite had a bitter relationship with him. William Pierce's story thus begins with his own absent father and his mother's unhappy tie to a Jewish stepfather. Marguerite moved about the South with her two young sons in tow. From these travails, William Pierce claimed he learned the virtues of self-discipline and the importance of delaying immediate gratification for a greater goal, values, he said, that became constant themes in his life. Pierce worked as a child to help his mom feed the family. He would later write that his difficult upbringing made him into the man he later became. Quote, I think, this ex I think this external discipline, this external control, being forced over a long period of time to do things I didn't want to do but that were necessary to do, helped me develop self-discipline. A lot of children these days never learn that. It's amazing how many adults can't do that. They can't stick at a job they don't want to do. Young Bill was clearly a brilliant boy. He did well in high school and went to a military academy in Bryan, Texas from 1949 to 1951. He earned a job there, cleaning the chemistry lab stockroom, and that job wound up stoking what would become a deep love of science. William went to college and then graduate school, where he studied to become a physicist. 
He worked at the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena for a year and married Patricia Jones, who was also a brilliant mathematician. The couple moved to Boulder, and Pierce finished his doctorate in physics in 1962. His dissertation, which had something to do with nuclear dipole and electric quadrupole resonance, held no hints as to the sort of man he would become. Pierce got a job as the assistant professor of physics at Oregon State University in Corvallis. He and his wife had twins, and they settled into what seemed like it would be a perfectly dull, normal, healthy life. Pierce later wrote, Until I was 30 years old, I had hardly given a thought to politics, to race, or to social questions. That changed after he started working at Oregon State University. He started showing up at meetings of the John Birch Society. Now, you may not have heard of these guys, but they're one of the most important organizations in the history of the American radical right. Named after an American advisor in China who the group's founder, Robert Welsh, considered to be the first American who died fighting communists, the John Birch Society publications encouraged the U.S. to withdraw from the U.N., urged the impeachment of Chief Justice Earl Warren, accused former President Eisenhower of being a secret communist, and other similar battiness. Here's a quote from one of their 1960 publications, The Blue Book, which William Pierce would certainly have read. Now if the danger from the communist conspiracy were all we had to worry about, it would be enough. But every thinking and informed man senses that, even as cunning and ruthless and de as determined as are the activists whom we call communists with a capital C, the conspiracy could never have reached its present extensiveness, and the gangsters at the head of it could never have reached their present power, unless there were tremendous weaknesses in the whole body of our civilization, weaknesses to make the advance of such a disease so rapid and its ravages so disastrous. Now, Robert Welch always denied any anti-Semitic leanings within the John Birch Society, but many people suspected that the weaknesses Welch saw in American society were, in fact, Jewish people. This is because John Birch Society propaganda was often incredibly similar to the Third Reich's own propaganda. The Nazis also felt like communism was brought down on societies by hidden actors who weakened the state enough for this disease to advance on it. The main difference between the two is that the Nazis named the Jews explicitly, and the John Birch Society did not. Pierce's primary issue with the John Birch Society is that it wasn't willing to discuss the Jews or explicitly racial issues. The Birchers were far right, but they didn't want anyone to mistake them for literal Nazis. Pierce later wrote, quote, I quickly found out that the two topics on which I wanted an intelligent discussion, race and Jews, were precisely the two topics Birch Society members were forbidden to discuss. William Pierce maintained a successful career as a physicist while he devoured more and more John Birch propaganda. In 1965, he left the university and got a job in Connecticut, working for the Pratt & Whitney Aircraft Plant as a senior research associate physicist. He made good money, and he did well, but his co-workers described him as a real loner who worked poorly with others and seemed almost unable to manage subordinates. Pierce's political leanings were kept more or less under wraps until the plant's workers went on strike. This face-to-face -face contact with what Pierce considered communism infuriated him so much that he tried to drive his car through a picket of a thousand Union men. This is perhaps not so surprising, since William Pierce had used his move to the East Coast as an opportunity to start visiting the American Nazi Party headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. William and George Lincoln Rockwell got along well, and Pierce found National Socialism a perfect fit with the beliefs he'd been developing since his move to Oregon. His only issue with Rockwell and the Nazis was, well, all the Nazi stuff. Pierce thought that the old-fashioned fascia uniforms and swastikas made them look like they were LARPers rather than serious revolutionaries. Obviously, he didn't use the term LARPer, but he accused them of Hollywood antics, which amounts to the same thing. In May of 1966, Pierce resigned from his factory job and moved his family to Virginia. His wife Patricia started teaching university math so she could support her husband in his, you know, Nazi efforts. Weirdly enough, Patricia wasn't a Nazi and later divorced her husband for his beliefs. But for a time, she was willing to, I don't know, humor him? She may have thought it was a phase he was going to get over eventually. Spoilers, he did not. In Blood and Politics, Zeskin writes... Over the decades, Pierce showed little emotional commitment to his two sons or multiple wives. Only his mother, Marguerite, and his Siamese cat successfully vied with his single-minded devotion to national socialist politics. During these early years, he began a small business selling guns, NS arms, and registered with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. His inventory included machine guns. The business folded after the passage of gun control legislation in 1968. One guess as to what NS arms stood for. <laughs> 
Now, Rockwell and Pierce embarked on a publishing venture together, putting out six issues of a Nazi magazine. But William refused to actually join the group until Rockwell changed its name from the American Nazi Party to the National Socialist White People's Party. When Rockwell was gunned down outside the parking lot of that laundromat, the movement he had spent his adult life crafting quickly began to fracture. Nazis were, then and now and always, catty bitches. GLR had kept his party together by sheer force of will, and even he hadn't done a great job of that, what with the whole getting murdered by one of his own men thing. Pierce stuck with the NSWPP, which retained the most members after Rockwell's death. For a while, he tried to take Rockwell's place, acting as the functional head of the party, writing all its propaganda and even speaking at university campuses. He did not have Rockwell's talent for drawing media attention. His only real success was saying that Nixon should be dragged out of his office and shot, which drew some coverage and got the FBI to start looking into him. During this period, Pierce became something of a mentor to a fellow named James Mason. Young James had joined Rockwell's American Nazi Party back in 1966, when he was 14. Two years later, at age 16, James got in trouble at school. He was disciplined by his principal, and in retaliation, started planning to go on a shooting spree and murder multiple members of the school's administration. Before carrying out his plan, he called the NSWPP's headquarters and wound up on the horn with William Pierce. The two talked it out, and Pierce convinced Mason to move to Virginia, work for the party, and learn how to run a printing machine instead of massacring his classmates. We'll be talking about Mason more in a later chapter. He would go on to write a book titled Siege, which provided the nuts and bolts inspiration for the terrorist group Atomwaffen. But I'm getting ahead of myself. As the 60s wound to a close, Pierce started to get frustrated with the NSWPP, mainly with the fact that, again, it was just too darn Nazi-y. He believed fascism needed an authentically American character and movement if it was going to have any chance of taking over in this country. Just dressing up as Nazis was not going to cut it. He quit the party in July of 1970 and published a paper titled Prospectus for a National Front, which he circulated around neo-Nazi circles. Here's how it opened. America today, and more specifically the American people, face the most serious and deadly menace which has arisen in their entire history. This menace far overshadows that posed by any war we have fought, any economic catastrophe through which we have passed, or any previous domestic strife which has torn us. For today we are faced not just with a threat to our territorial integrity, or to our material possessions, or to our way of life, or even to our own lives, but to something far dearer. Today, all that we ever have been and all that we ever might be, our race itself, is threatened with extinction. Pierce went on to complain that none of the existing radical right-wing organizations in the United States had the ability to turn into a, quote, large-scale revolutionary movement. Their long-established and unbroken record of failure is the best evidence of this fact, he wrote. He attacked the movement for being filled with overgrown children and said, in essence, we need to stop waiting around for a new Hitler to rise up and unify all of our fringe little groups. Instead, Pierce suggested America's fascists take a leaf out of communism's book and create a National Front, a large umbrella organization that would combine and coordinate all the different right-wing groups and allow them to recruit people more easily, without the baggage of swastikas and Klan robes. Towards this end, William Pierce established the National Alliance in 1974. We'll talk more about it throughout this book, but obviously the National Alliance didn't wind up being the trick to create a mass fascist movement in the United States. It was objectively more successful than Rockwell's American Nazi Party, drawing in thousands of members over the years and generating millions of dollars in income, but it proved no more capable of creating a popular revolution than the ANP had been. However, buried in Pierce's prospectus was a very important paragraph that contained a realization far more crucial than his national alliance would ever become. Quote, About the only good thing which can be said of all these little groups is that they do generate quite a flood of pamphlets, leaflets, bulletins, newsletters, and other printed materials which express some excellent sentiment, but even here it is largely an incestuous sort of affair in which the propaganda and the sentiment are circulated largely within the same vaguely defined movement in which they were born. Any real contact or rapport with the general population is absent, and this lack of contact with the public is not due simply to problems of distribution or a lack of access to the mass media. Most movement literature would fail to evoke a sympathetic response from the masses, even if it could be placed regularly in their hands. It is, for the most part, too esoteric, too introverted, and too kooky to strike a responsive chord among the general public. 
Pierce correctly understood that to really make progress, American fascism was going to have to craft propaganda that could infect the hearts and minds of normal white Americans. It would take years for Pierce to translate this insight into action, but when he did, the result would quite literally shake the world. First, however, came his dalliance with a sprightly gentleman named Willis Carto. Now, Carto is one of the very few individuals in this story whose commitment to fashdom precedes the activism of George Lincoln Rockwell. He started a monthly paper in 1955 called, revealingly in my opinion, Entitled Right, the Journal of Forward-Thinking American Nationalism. According to Zeskind, quote, it promoted many of the anti-communist, anti-Semitic, and segregationist ideas then circulating on the far right. In 1957, Carto first wrote openly about his idea to create something called the Liberty Lobby, which he promised would, quote, lock horns with the minority special interest pressure groups in order to support the needs of white people who, it must be said, were suffering mightily in the 1950s. Carto wrote that, quote, to the goal of political power, all else must temporarily be sacrificed. He spent his life embodying that creed. Now, Willis Carto was not an out-in-the-street bullhorn and placards activist, nor was he an armed revolutionary, clutching a rifle and calling for racial holy war. Instead, he sought to bring anti-communists and segregationists together and craft a thoroughly American fascist movement. In 1962, he started publishing a magazine, Western Destiny, dedicated to inculcating these ideas among the American right. He wrote about culture creators, white people, and their eternal battle against culture destroyers, black people. Tolerance, Carto wrote, can often be a culture-retarding and culture-distorting weakness. Western Destiny began to attract a dedicated audience of budding extremists, including a teenager named David Duke. It is possible that Willis Carto is the man who red-pilled Duke. Throughout the 1960s, William Pierce, as William Pierce was coming up with his idea for a national front, Willis Carto built the Liberty Lobby into a moderately large mailing list for the distribution of far-right, but not openly fascist, propaganda. He latched on to the 1968 presidential bid of a fellow named George Wallace. The 45th governor of Alabama, Wallace was one of the leading voices against the civil rights movement. His most famous line is probably this. In the name of the greatest people that have ever trod the earth, I draw a line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny, and I say, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. One guess as to what color of people Wallace thought were the greatest on earth. So, you can see why George Wallace would appeal to a guy like Willis Carto. Carto turned the Liberty Lobby towards the cause of getting Wallace elected president. He was, of course, unsuccessful in this goal, but the campaign was an incredible success for the Liberty Lobby. By its end, they'd become the home for almost but not quite Nazi politics in the United States. Their newsletter, the Liberty Letter, had 170,000 subscribers. When Wallace's campaign fell apart, Carto was able to swoop in and acquire a mailing list with the names of another 230,000 people, members of a group called Youth for Wallace. Willis felt that the failure of George Wallace to win the presidency was no good reason to let the movement of young fascists he'd inspired go to waste. Under Carto, Youth for Wallace was molded into the National Youth Alliance, according to Zeskin's Blood and Politics. Quote, In the subsequent months, the National Youth Alliance sponsored several regional meetings, including a January 1969 event at Conley's Motor Hotel in Monroeville, outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It was here that the youth organization first began to unravel. Several officers in the new group objected to the content and tenor of the meeting, and an attendant social at a supporter's home. They claimed that the affair was awash in Nazi heraldry, including women who wore swastika jewelry and men who sang the Horst Wessel Lied, a Nazi party anthem from the 1930s. The host and MC promoted a new booklet by Carto's West Coast Enterprise, Noontide Press, Myth of the Six Million. It argued that the Nazi genocide was a figment of the Jewish imagination. One of the formal presentations was, en was entitled Plato the Fascist. So, Cardo had revealed his power level too quickly, and the National Youth Alliance quickly alienated the majority of its potential membership. These people may not have felt black and white folks should use the same water fountains, but they weren't about to identify themselves as Nazis. Most of them probably had parents who'd fought the Nazis. But Carto's work had attracted some new blood, William Pierce, and a sizable herd of national socialists. They started hovering around the Liberty Lobby like flies on the rotting corpse of George Wallace's presidential ambitions. They worked together for a while, but it was an acrimonious pairing, and the straight-up national socialists conflicted with Carto's old guard, who were fine basically towing the Nazi line, but not fine actually identifying as Nazis. Carto and Pierce wound up breaking apart, and after a complex series of bureaucratic battles I don't care to recount, Pierce wound up reincorporating the National Youth Alliance in Virginia in October of 1970. 
Carto accused Pierce of stealing the Liberty Lobby's mailing list, which was probably true. Pierce accused Carto of embezzling $55,000 from his own organization, which was also probably true. Carto accused Pierce's faction, who were, again, literal Nazis, of being Zionists. Pierce responded by calling Carto swarthy, which was racist code for not white enough. The fighting between Pierce and Carto just underscored how unsuccessful Pierce's efforts to build a national front had been. His plan had been to start by recruiting more students, starting in the D.C. area, but this was a miserable failure. When he was invited to speak at George Washington University for some reason in February of 1972, Pierce couldn't gather more than two dozen students. Anti-fascists showed up and threw raw eggs at him and his men. I should note that in the immediate wake of the Christchurch shooting, a far-right Australian politician, Senator Fraser Anning, blamed the massacre on, quote, an immigration program which allowed Muslim fanatics to migrate to New Zealand in the first place. Shortly thereafter, a heroic teenager hit him in the head with an egg. $70,000 was raised on a GoFundMe for the boy's defense, which he donated instead to the victims of the Christchurch shooting. I write a lot in this book about all the historical linkages between old school and modern fascists, but let us also acknowledge that anti-fascists have their own long-standing traditions, and one of them is apparently egging. Anyway, on February 26th, 1974, William Pierce decided to revamp the National Youth Alliance into a new organization, the National Alliance, which he incorporated in Virginia. He continued to publish the organization's newsletter, Attack! with an exclamation point, which included guides for how to bomb movie theaters and articles on which guns would work best in urban uprisings. It was the sort of fair Nazi newsletters had always focused on. But the next year, in January of 1975, Pierce introduced his first real innovation into the annals of right-wing terror, a book titled The Turner Diaries. Published in sections across several issues of Attack, the book pre is presented as a series of diary entries from a revolutionary. You might compare it to a Nazi answer to A Handmaid's Tale. The Turner Diaries were meant to take place in a near-future America in which a Jewish-dominated liberal government had taken over and forcibly instituted such horrors as multiculturalism and gun control. Pierce presents those things from a Nazi point of view, of course, so multiculturalism is presented as feral, animalistic black people raping white women at will, and gun control is portrayed as the forcible confiscation of all privately owned firearms. There are equality police in this book, to give you an idea of its tenor. The hero, Earl Turner, is a normal white man who gets swept up in a secret terrorist organization led by a group called The Order, who organized their insurgency in a series of small cells to carry out vicious terrorist attacks, including the bombing of an FBI headquarters. The goal of these attacks is to destabilize the American government and provoke a vicious race war. The Order funds its operations by robbing banks and armored cars, which allow them to buy weapons and explosives to carry out more attacks and, gradually, to tip the country into a nightmare. The book launched a number of concepts into the fascist mindset, not the least of which is the idea of the day of the rope. I'm going to quote now from the Turner Diaries, and a section later in the book. Quote, Today has been the day of the rope, a grim and bloody day, but an unavoidable one. Today, tonight, from tens of thousands of lampposts, power poles, and trees throughout this vast metropolitan area, the grisly forms hang. In the lighted streets, one sees them everywhere. Even the street signs at intersections have been pressed into service, and at practically every street corner I passed this evening on my way to HQ, there was a dangling corpse, four at every intersection. Hanging from a single overpass only about a mile from here is a group of about 30, each with an identical placard around its neck bearing the printed legend, I Betrayed My Race. Two or three of that group have been decked out in academic robes before they were strung up, and the whole batch are apparently faculty members from the nearby UCLA campus. The first thing I saw in the moonlight was the placard with the legend in large block letters, I defiled my race. Above the placard leered the horribly bloated, purplish face of a young woman, her eyes wide open and bulging, her mouth agape. Finally, I can make out the thin vertical line of rope disappearing into the branches above. Apparently, the rope had slipped a bit, and the branch to which it was tied had sagged until the woman's feet were resting on the pavement, giving the uncanny appearance of a corpse standing upright of its own volition. I shuddered and quickly went on my way. There are many thousands of hanging female corpses like that in this city tonight, all wearing identical placards around their necks. They are the white women who are married to or living with blacks, with Jews, or with other non-white males. Earl Turner dies in the book, carrying out a suicidal but successful assault on the Pentagon, but the order is victorious in the end. The book is essentially framed as a historical document, with researchers from Earl's future commenting on it. They note that after the U.S. was purged of all non-white people, the same thing was done to the rest of the planet, using a series of nuclear and chemical weapons attacks to cleanse Asia. It's super fucked up! But it took off like gangbusters among the American far right. It was eventually published as a book, selling as many as 500,000 copies. 
The Turner Diaries did not sell the traditional way, in like Barnes and Nobles or whatever. Instead, it proliferated virally on the gun show circuit, at survivalist conventions, and in tiny small town shops owned by racists. 500,000 copies is a substantial success, even by mainstream publishing standards. It's not an earth-shattering book, but, you know, it's still really good sales. I found a good article in The Atlantic by J.M. Berger, who authored a scholarly papal title titled The Turner Legacy. It notes, The Turner Diaries is notable for its lack of ideological persuasion. At one point in the novel, its protagonist, Earl Turner, is given a book to read. Turner claims the book perfectly explains the reasons for white supremacy and the justification of all the Order's actions. Importantly, this magical tome's contents are never specified. Although the novel's epilogue broadly hints at a Nazi orientation, the book never explicitly identifies the Order with a specific movement. Due in part to Pierce's desire to appeal to normal people, as well as the novel's limited circulation among neo-Nazis, Turner assumes its readers are already racist and do not need to be recruited to that mindset. The abandonment of why empowers a single narrative focus on what and how, the necessity of immediate violent action and concrete suggestions about how to go about it. This is part of why the book has so often been associated with violence and terrorism. The Turner Diaries would go on to become probably the most influential single piece of fascist propaganda since Mein Kampf. It's inspired more than 200 murders since its publication, but it's also inspired a hell of a lot more than just murder. The Turner Diaries became the ideological underpinning of a vicious American insurgency, which eventually led to hundreds and hundreds of armed men around the country working actively towards the establishment of a white supremacist state. The Turner Diaries also inspired a whole genre of fascist and quasi-fascist propaganda books, written to the same rubric, but reining in on the racism just a little bit in order to avoid freaking out the normies. In 1996, John Ross published Unintended Consequences, a novel that is best described as The Turner Diaries, but all the racism is whispered. The cover of the copy I have features a burning copy of the Constitution with a black-clad cop attempting to sexually assault Lady Justice in front of it. Its main innovation from the Turner Diaries was to switch the focus of its revolutionaries away from race war and towards just gun rights. The plot focuses around a man, Henry Bowman, who winds up being framed by the ATF for some stupid reason related to their desire to take all of America's guns. He kills most of the ATF agents who come for him, and then brutally tortures one who he captures. Bowman and a small group of gun rights advocates then carry out a terrorist campaign, horribly murdering gun control advocates around the nation until the president repeals all gun control laws. Alex Jones has mentioned multiple times on InfoWars that Unintended Consequences is one of his favorite books. In more recent years, a guy named Matt Bracken has written a whole series of books, starting with Enemies Foreign and Domestic. Like Unintended Consequences, his first book is basically Turner Diaries with less racism. The liberal government creates a false flag mass shooting to take away everyone's guns. The ATF is the bad guy, and brave patriots beat them via terrorism. Bracken's innovation was to have the cast of his books include numerous non-white people. The idea seems to be that, if most of the characters aren't white, then the book can't be racist. On an unrelated note, the second book in the series is Domestic Enemies, The Reconquista. Its plot is that the evil liberals orchestrate an invasion of Mexicans with the goal of having them ban English in the Southwest and secede from the United States. J.M. Berger, this time writing for the Daily Beast, identified some similarities between Bracken's third book and the Turner Diaries. Quote, after an earthquake demolishes Memphis, black refugees turn into a seething mob of gang rapists and cannibals, characterizations that feature memorably in the Turner Diaries, while urban blacks loot a path from Baltimore to Washington, D.C., where they demand and receive a new socialist constitution engineered by a thinly car veiled caricature of President Obama. Their narrative disclaimers continue. One character condemns white racist killings in the chaos after the quake, and a battle-weary right white racist girl near the end of the book accepts the hand of comfort offered by a black army medic. But these and other moments of individual race grace are hard-pressed to counterweight the vivid, lengthy depiction of African Americans en masse as cannibal rapists directly responsible for destroying America's constitution. In writing the Turner Diaries, William Pierce ignited a movement within the far right that is still very much present and relevant today. The next chapter will discuss, in depth, the generation of terrorists who were inspired by his words to take horrifying, bloody action. Like Christian identity, the Turner Diaries have influenced many people who may never have even read the book. In his manifesto, the Christchurch mosque shooter wrote about his hope that his attack would spark renewed calls for gun control in the United States, because he believed this would lead inevitably to a new civil war. The Poway synagogue shooter repeated the same desire. William Pierce died in 2002, but his ideas live and kill to this day. The struggle between William Pierce and Willis Carto would prove to be a microcosm of a larger struggle within the fascist right itself. 
on Cardo's side are the mainstreamers. Their goal was to gain political power by pushing the Overton win window further and further right and convincing more and more of their fellow Americans to adopt hardcore fascist politics. Carto supported political parties and candidates, most notably David Duke's successful run for the Louisiana State Senate as a Republican and unsuccessful run for governor. He was also a backer of Pat Buchanan. Carto and other mainstreamers believe that the main majority of white Americans can be converted to their political ideals, so gaining power is just a matter of properly propagandizing to their fellow white people. William Pierce, on the other hand, was a vanguardist. Vanguardists believe that politics is hopeless, and the only way for their side to win is to, as in the Turner Diaries, form small, dedicated groups and basically bring on the collapse of society in order to take control. George Lincoln Rockwell himself is hard to pin down. He had elements of both mainstreamer and vanguardist in his writings and in his activism. But his most direct descendants, men like William Pierce and James Mason, became two of the most influential minds in the vanguardist movement. And the vanguardist movement is the chunk of the white supremacist movement that we are focusing on in this audiobook. Because in the late 1970s, a new wave of fascists and neo-Nazis began to rise. For more than a decade, they would build a potent insurgency, armed with missiles, machine guns, and bombs, utterly dedicated to a single dire mission, turning the Turner Diaries into reality. <laughs> 